I'm Adam McMahon. I'm one of the pastors here. I am not Ben. Ben is not sick. Both of those things are good. That, both that I'm not him and that he's sick, I guess. Or not sick. He's not sick. Uh, we're letting him take a day off for Mother's Day. He gets to take days off even when he's not sick, which is great. Uh, he needs a day. We're just, he needs a day to relax, be with uh, Jess and the boys, and we're glad that he gets to do that. So uh, speaking of that, I do want to welcome you and say Happy Mother's Day. Uh, Happy Mother's Day. Thanks. I got a response. I appreciate that. Anyway, hey, uh, I do want to say that. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you. I also want to recognize that for, like, a lot of people, Mother's Day can be bittersweet, right? Like, it can be happy, but also there's some sadness there. Uh, and, and I found some words online that I think are in authentic to integrity. Now, I didn't write them. We didn't write them together or anything like that. But I think they're true for me. I think I would say this. And for us as a church family, and I found them, and I just want to read them just as a way of, in a sense of like celebrating the, the bittersweetness of, of uh, Mother's Day, both the good and the bad there. So let me read these to you and... It's just some lines about all the different kind of aspects of what Mother's Day is about. So here we go. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, which I know there's a lot in here, uh, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make things harder. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you've longed it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nest in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. I want to say happy Mother's Day. Thank you for being a mother, having a mother. Thank you for being here on this Mother's Day. And before I begin, will you pray with me this morning? Uh, Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you've done here in our midst and even this morning as we, as we lift up your word, as we dig into your word. We pray that uh, I would be used by you. We pray that your word would, would uh, sharpen us, that it would refine us. And as we sit here this morning, that you would teach us. We're here we're here to be used by you. Uh, enlighten God's word upon us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, I say I love this time of year like because we get to be outside, right? It, it's not too hot, so hot that you're like, I have to run from air conditioning to air conditioning. And it's not so cold that you just don't really enjoy it. And I love it 
However, as I can feel in my throat this morning, I always have to take allergy meds this time of year to, in order to love being outside. But I love being outdoors. And so last weekend, my family and I, uh, we went to near Asheville, up in the mountains, and we spent time there hiking, like mountain biking, checking out waterfalls, just running around. <clears throat> and as I was up there, I got to thinking about another experience I had up in the mountains. It was probably the most peaceful experience like I've ever had. And I was fly fishing uh, in a stream in one morning in the middle of the week, which means there wasn't a lot of other people around in Colorado at this pretty remote place. And I'll be honest, I wasn't catching anything, but it's okay. And I was just going through the casting motions, you know, just casting back and forth, trying to lay a fly down. And as I stood there, I began to kind of experience all the dimensions, all the different facets of, of the mountains that usually I ignore. Like, usually I ignore when I'm outside or in the mountains because I'm too busy or too fixated on trying to do the next adventure or doing the next thing or trying to take care of the kids or, or whatever it is. And I started to just experience the outdoors. I mean, have you ever had that happen where, where you really just begin to take, like, take it all in? And take in everything with your senses. And I realized, like, as I was standing there, that the water I was standing in was kind of chilly. Like, it was that time that it was kind of chilly. I felt it cold around my waders. Actually, it was pretty chilly in the air, too. And, and part of that was because the sun, like, hadn't yet risen over the mountains. It was that, you know, when you're in the mountains, the sun sometimes takes forever. Like, it'll be nearly noon before the sun actually rises over the mountains. And so you're still in the shade, and it's still chilly until the sun beats down on you. And so I was still in that time, and, and I could experience that. I felt the breeze, like, on the hair of my arms, and I could, could see it blowing through the grass by the creek. I could feel the breeze on, on there, and I could smell the mountain pines. Like, it's a scent that, like, I've only ever experienced in Colorado. I don't even know how to describe it, but it's, like, this amazing scent that if I could bottle it up, I swear I would sell so much money, make so much money off of it. But it's, it's amazing. And I could hear the leaves blowing as the breeze went down the valley, and I heard the birds chirping, and, and I couldn't hear any road noise, which was amazing. Like, so peaceful, just serene nature. And as I cast my fly upstream and I let it sit on the water, I could see the eddies move and, and catch the fly or my leader. And for a moment, I didn't even care that it would drag my fly unnaturally, which is not good uh, if you're a fly from that. I didn't even care. Like, I was so just lost in the moment and the wonder of what God had created. There was this moment for like maybe like even 10 or 15 minutes where I was able to experience this multifaceted dimensions of nature. I was able to grasp some small part of all the elements that God has created here, that he, he melded them together, and we get to enjoy that. I mean, it was this amazing, beautiful moment. Honestly, I'm sure I lost uh, because my fly got stuck in a tree or something like that. Like, sure, that happened. But for a moment there, I was able to experience it. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever, like, had been so experienced something with all of your senses, and you were able to just, like, be present there? Like maybe you don't love the mountains, and so you don't really connect with that, but you love listening to the ocean, and you can just be on the beach, and you can feel the sand and, and hear the ocean waves and feeling the breeze at the beach. Or I've seen people at art exhibits, uh, museums, where they'll sit and they'll stare at art for just hours, and they'll just catch every dimension of it, and they can just get totally lost in this artwork. Henry Nouwen actually wrote a book called The Prodigal Son, and it's all about Rembrandt's The Prodigal Son and, and how that relates, and he just, it talks all about that. And, and so you can get lost in this dimension of art, or by uh, musician friends, they can experience all these different dimensions of a piece of, of a song or a piece of music, and they can pause and experience something. And I think when you do that, when you pause there for a moment, you can begin to see all these different facets all these different dimensions of a space of, or of, of an element or something that you're looking at or something you're a part of. And this is what we're looking at as we look at the Lord's Supper today. As we dig into the scriptures, we're going to see these different elements of the Lord's Supper. But first, like we've been continuing through 1 Corinthians for a while now. Uh, we're continuing that today. We're going to keep going on through with that for a little while longer. In 1 Corinthians 11.2, which is a little, which was what uh, Ben spoke about a little bit last week, there's a hinge in the letter 
where he starts to talk. He turns this corner to the, this first Corinthian, first century church in Corinth, where he starts addressing what's happening in their gatherings, in their weekend gatherings. And then for the next three and a half chapters, specifically 11, 12, 13, and 14, deals with what happens when the people of Corinth, when they come together, like we do every weekend. And Paul refers to these events as meetings or gatherings or later on just the church. Now, unfortunately, their gatherings were a complete wreck. Like they're a dumpster fire, like really just awful. People are getting drunk. Other people are going away hungry. I mean, just actually like starving. And it was this chaotic and and out of control atmosphere. In fact, like Paul goes so far as to say, Their meetings are doing more harm than good. Like, that is bad. But then he takes the next three and a half chapters, and he tries to untangle this mess of their gatherings. But get this, here's the beauty for us here this morning, and as we continue on in 1 Corinthians, that we're here, we're here thousands of years later. But because of the Corinthians' baggage, we get to see a bit of what happened in the early church, like a bit of what the early church gatherings were actually like. We get to experience this. We get to see it. And a big part of the early church gatherings were the Lord's Supper, and this week, we're diving in on that. We're going we're gonna to camp in on this, on the Lord's Supper. Or it's called communion or the Eucharist, which is just Greek for giving thanks, but it's also another reference for that. And that's a different terms for all for the same act of worship. But we're going to pause a moment. We're going to focus in. We're going to meditate and look at the facets of communion. Now, if you're a note taker in here this morning, there's six of them. So you get to write a lot. So that's fun. So six different Asset, uh, facets, six different dimensions or aspects that Paul brings out in just this last half chapter uh, of chapter 11, in verse, or in, starting in verse 17. So look at me with verse, in verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. We'll read through 34. And before we begin to like dissect the passage, I want to read all of it out loud so we don't miss the forest for the trees. I think sometimes whenever we can get into the scriptures and we get so busy digging into all the different little elements and we're doing word studies and all of that great, really fun stuff for me, really fun stuff, like we get to miss, like what is the, what's the entirety of what he's saying? Like what is he saying? I mean, scripture was just read. Like in the Corinthian passage, like they would just read this entire letter and that was what they would do. There was a public reading of scripture. And so we can sometimes miss this whenever we get in and we start dissecting it. And we're going to do that. But first, let's read it. We're going to read it all out loud. Well, I'll read it out loud. I'll read it out loud to you and kind of get the flow of this section. So here we go. Verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Remember earlier last week, he commended them for something. This week, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating... Each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. 
But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. So if you're taking notes, the first dimension is looking around. Like there's a sideways, right to left kind of dimension to communion where you're looking around. So first, look at verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, see that coming together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. I mean, that's some like really harsh feedback to receive. I mean, don't you just love it whenever someone says, can I give you some feedback? Like, like you know, it comes like here, just tell me what I did wrong. Like, that's how I feel whenever I hear that. But that's what Paul's doing here. I don't think I've ever received feedback nearly as harsh as what he's giving the Corinthians right now. But that's what he's doing. Can you, I mean, just imagine this, like, if Paul were to come into our church, come into Integrity this morning, and, and he comes and he tells us, hey, when you gather, you're actually making things worse. Like, I think I'd be like, all right, let's close it up. Like, we're done. This isn't worth it. Like, just stop meeting. Like, that is not good. <laughs> that is really bad. That's harsh. But that's how he's, he, he's feeling about it. And he, and he keeps going on with them. And, and it's mostly on this one issue, right? I mean, it's mostly about the Lord's Supper, yes, but about this part of it, like not looking around, not taking this as a part of the whole. So in verse 18, he says, he writes to them, he says, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Oh, so there's one good thing that comes from church division. I know I thought there was nothing, but there is one. Genuine people may be recognized. Now, I got to tell you, from my own experience in churches, it's rarely the ones, okay, probably never the ones, who actually think they're righteous, who are the genuinely righteous ones. Anyone else ever had that experience? Just me? Okay, well, I mean, just in case. If there's ever division, probably if you think you're righteous, you probably aren't. That's just a heads up, self-awareness. Okay, now to the heart of the issue here, verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Okay, he's continuing this great feedback. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One gets hung goes hungry, another gets drunk. Okay, so there's three pieces of background cultural information that we got to get to like understand what's happening because we're so far removed from what, what was going on in first century Corinth. So first century Corinth first is like, it was a stratified society. So we have the rich and you have the poor. The rich are way up here and the poor are way down here. There's not anywhere, like, it's not, it's not they weren't close. They were very far apart. There were the uber wealthy and then everybody else. And yet, and so then you also have like, you have masters and slaves, Roman citizens, non-citizens, all sorts of strata that existed. That was normal in Paul's day. It was just a part the, of, of the day. It's part of the culture, just as we accept certain disparities today that we see in our culture. Secondly, feasts or meals were a vital, central part of Greco-Roman society. They happened constantly. All the time, people would gather at wealthy Corinthians' houses for feasts. But get this, the feasts were divided too. There was an indoor dining room called a triclinium that seated about 10 to 20 people. And that was only for the wealthy. And then the next, there was this open-air courtyard called an atrium. That one is pretty obvious, open-air courtyard, atrium, which seated about 50 or 60 people. But that was only for the poor. Uh, the working class, that was 50 to 60 working class, slaves, plebeians, only for that kind of the normal down-to-earth people. And at the feast, the best food and the best wine were always for the rich in the triclinium, the 5 or 10, 15 people inside. And then the lousy leftovers were left for the people out in the atrium. They would, they would just throw them stuff. And we actually have these records of an animal sacrifice at a feast and half the animal and the best parts of this animal went to the 10 people inside, and then the rest went to like the 60 people who were outside. 
So you get this picture of this disparity. That was just normal in Paul's day. I mean, that sounds crazy to you and me and kind of and it sounds pretty harsh, but I mean, that's life. That's what life is going on for them. And then finally, the third uh, element of the historical kind of record we have is the, the at least weekly gathering of the church. It was centered around the feast. They called it the love feast. It was around a meal that became a part of the Lord's Supper. So they might have a sermon, they might have music, they might have prophecy, we'll get to that later, but they always had a meal. The Corinthians, they took what was normal and what was cultural around them and they brought it into their gatherings. And they were at wealthy people's houses. This is where their gatherings were happening. And so when the church came together, the church comes together, the rich are inside in the triclinium and the poor are outside. The rich have the best food, the best wine. They get drunk and they're like, yeah, great party. Thank you. And the poor, and there's this famine going on at the back of 1 Corinthians. The poor go away hungry, literally starving. See, the city was getting into the church when it needed to be the other way around. And Paul, he lays into the Corinthians for that. He says, what is wrong with you? You have taken the Lord's Supper so far out of context that Paul says it's no longer the Lord's Supper that you eat. Then Paul in verse 22 says, What? What exclamation point? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? That, by the way, the answer should be, Oh, wait, we do. Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. He's saying you're despising God's church and you're humiliating the poor in this. I mean, Paul, he really takes them to task for this. So how does he resolve the problem? How do they resolve the problem? Well, one way is to look around, to focus on this facet of the Lord's Supper, this dimension of the Lord's Supper that is about looking around. So when he concludes, when he tells them, here's how you need to change this, if you skip down to verse 33, he says in summary, basically, he says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. The feast isn't about that. So then when you come together, it will not be for judgment. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But he's telling the Corinthians to eat together, not the wealthy eating the best in the triclinium while everyone else is still working and then getting what's thrown to them later. No, eat together as one body in unity without division. That would have been incredibly countercultural at that day. That would have been so incredibly different to have a feast where everyone is together, not separated. That would have been amazing. So let's apply this to Integrity Church today. How can we look around? When you approach the table, think about this. Think about, is there anyone, anybody you're not right with? Ask yourself, have I wronged anyone Have I sinned against anybody? Is there anybody in my life who's in need? Is there anyone I need to share resources with? Is there anyone I need to go to? Anyone I need to come alongside? Is there anybody I'm not right with? Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 23, that how you interact with others affects your worship. And he says this, So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now recognize this. This isn't your brother, you have something against your brother. This is your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer the gift. So be reconciled. Look around, see where you may have someone who's something or you've sinned against somebody, go and be reconciled to them. Your communion involves a community of believers. It's not simply the connection between you and God. 
I mean, it is that as well, but it's not simply that. It involves the entire church body. And actually, it involves more than just our church body. It involves the entire church universal, the church everywhere. So look around, and as much as is possible for you, be reconciled to those who you might have something against. Dwell on that. Think on that facet of looking around. And so Paul, he tells the Corinthians, eat together as one body in unity without division. So to get the Corinthians back on track, Paul then, he tells them a story. And in this story, there's the second dimension of communion, of looking back. If you're taking notes, write that down. Looking back. Look at verse 23 with me. Paul continues here. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Now, you may not know this, but that's semi-technical language for what historians call oral tradition. What you've got to understand here, and I think this is really cool, Corinthians is one of the first letters written in the New Testament. It's one of the first parts of the New Testament that we have, one of the earliest recordings that things were actually written down. So 1 Corinthians, it predates all four of the Gospels. So like Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, they're all written after 1 Corinthians, which means what we're about to read, what, what, he, what he wrote to them was the first story about Jesus' last supper actually put to paper in the New Testament. And here's what the story is about. And so he continues, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took, betrayed, took bread. Paul tells the story of where the Lord's supper comes from. Now, we don't have time to go through the entire history of the Lord's Supper, but there's a, here's a short summary for you. The Lord's Supper originates in the Last Supper, which in turn comes from the Passover. And if you're new to the Bible, the Passover, it's the central feast, uh, central Jewish feast in the years before Jesus. The Passover, it commemorates the Exodus, the story where God saved the Hebrews from Egypt. He brought them into new life. It was symbolized by the Passover lamb. The Passover also looks forward to what people in Jesus' referred, day referred to as the new covenant. This term, among others, it was used to envision what it would be like when God returns with the Messiah to rescue and redeem Israel, and through Israel, the entire planet in the future, in the day of the Lord, in this new covenant era. Now, Jesus, he celebrates the Passover on the night before he dies on the cross in the city of Jerusalem, and we call that the Last Supper. And the Passover had this really rigid but healthy liturgy during Jesus' time. By the time that he, had, he came, it had developed this real healthy but very rigid liturgy. You'd have the leader stand up, and he'd stand up, and he would start with the bread before the meal, and he would break the bread, and he would stand up, and he would speak these words. And I quote, This is the bread of affliction our forefathers ate when they came out of Egypt. So get this, Jesus, the rabbi, with his disciples in the upper room, he stands up at Passover. He breaks open the bread and he says, look in verse 24, he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now changing the liturgy would have been scandalous. And that's what Jesus did. He changes the Passover liturgy. Jesus reinterprets the bread. Not only is the bread of our forefathers who ate, but also as his body. And what he's doing here is he's pointing to his upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. And then after that, Jesus, he sits down. He sits back down. He eats the Passover meal with his disciples. And then at the end, at the end of the meal, at verse 25, it says that in the same way, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Okay, so the last cup in the liturgy is called the cup of blessing. This cup looks forward to the coming of the new covenant and the Messiah. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Meaning this cup speaks of me. I am what the new cup looks forward to. He's saying, I am the Messiah, and I am here now. Jesus reinterprets the cup around his coming death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
He reinterprets the central symbols of the Passover. And when he's done, he says, do this, bread and cup, do this in remembrance of me. For my followers, here's how you remember me. When you get together, you do this. Of all things, here's what you do. Bread and cup in remembrance of me. Looking back, we remember the communion is about Jesus. Communion is about the fact that God is not far off, that God steps into human history in the person of Jesus. God puts humanity on. He puts clothes on. He incarnates himself. He steps in and he reaches out and he rescues, redeems, chases after broken people and he saves. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, he's after you this morning. So the second dimension, looking back, remembering the story and the context of the Lord's Supper. We're called to remember his body broken and his blood given. Now, if you're taking notes, another dimension of the Lord's Supper, looking upward. So while the Lord's Supper communion isn't only about you and God, it is also about you and God. One dimension or facet of the beauty of the Lord's Supper is about you. It's about this communion that one has with God in taking the bread and the wine. Those symbols of the Passover feast that Jesus reinterpreted to point to what was about to happen at the cross. You see, we're able to commune with God because of what happened at the cross, at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I don't think we all get the gravity of the cross very often. Am I right? I mean, I think we, we, because we hear it all the time, we hear about the death of Jesus, and we kind of get numb to it. We get oblivious to the weight of what happened on the cross, what theology calls substitutionary atonement. I know that's really kind of like a uh, semi-technical religious language, but the reality behind that language is beautiful. It's amazing. The reality is that Jesus died on the cross as a substitute, meaning in your place or in my place to make you right with God substitutionary atonement. And that is what Paul gets at. Paul points to the theology that Jesus dies in your place, meaning what happened to Jesus should have happened to you. Pain, death, suffering, judgment, wrath, all of that was for you. But Jesus takes not only your sins, not only your mistakes, your baggage, the skeletons in your closet, the things you could give anything to go back and do over. He takes all of that on his perfect, flawless, innocent shoulders. But not only your sins, he also takes the punishment, the wrath, and the justice of God. Now, God is love, but he's also justice, and he thirsts to put the world back together again and to repair the broken fabric of the universe from where sin ripped things apart. And Jesus takes God's justice, takes his judgment, his punishment, his wrath for your sins. He takes all of that on his back and he goes to the cross in your place and he dies as a substitute to make you right. That is substitutionary atonement and it's beautiful, amen? You see, Because of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, when we believe that truth, we become new creations and we receive the Holy Spirit. And when you come to the table, by your belief that what happened to Jesus should have happened to you, you stand there by the scandalous, sheer grace of God, knowing you have no right to come into God's presence. And at the same time, you have every right in the world because you are, in Paul's language, in Christ. You have been made right with God. See, we don't come to the table to get forgiveness. We come to the table because we are forgiven. And we come to the the table to live the way forgiven people live. And so you commune with God, meaning you connect, you engage, you listen, you experience, you encounter Jesus by the Spirit. You encounter the Spirit of God. And I can't put that into words, but I know it's real. It's not just symbolic. It's not just some lifeless ritual. 
It's an encounter with Jesus who's not far away. He is here by the Spirit of God. And when you come to the table and when you take communion, you look upward. Now, why do you look upward? Why do the biblical authors always talk about how God is up? Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm pretty sure my kids know more about physics just from watching YouTube than I do. But I'm pretty sure that's a metaphor. I'm pretty sure that's a metaphor. And by God is up, it's a metaphor for the reality that God is in some way transcendent. He's above. He's high. And when you go to the table, you look upward. You realize that God is here with you in communion. And so the Lord's Supper has this dimension of looking upward. It's this intimate moment when we engage with God and we're reminded of the beautiful reality of the substitutionary atonement. That Jesus died for us in our place And as we engage in this act of worship, we encounter Jesus. We connect with him. In communion, we find ourselves looking upward, acknowledging God's presence among us. Now the fourth facet of communion, and this one's going to be a little bit quicker, looking outward. It's this outward dimension of communion. So look at what Paul says in verse 26. He says, or he writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. See, there's there's a dimension of the Lord's Supper that extends outward to the world, to people who do not yet know Jesus. Communion is this act that is visible, tangible, with earthly, like real molecules, real bread, real drink, but it speaks. Or in Paul's language, it proclaims. Now, when you go to the table, you remember the story that Jesus in the gospel breaks himself open. And every time as followers of Jesus, we come to the table and we break open the bread and we take the cup. Jesus calls you and me to remember the story and to step into the story. You are a part of that reality. You are a follower of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, part of it is it means that you are now called to live like Jesus. You are called to break yourself open. You are called to pour yourself out for the needs of the world, just like Jesus on the cross. And when you go to the table, you look outward to people who do not yet know Jesus. Family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, employers, employees, roommates, profs, classmates, anybody. You fill in the blank. You're called to proclaim with your words, your actions, your symbolic acts in your life. You're called to pour yourself out for the needs of the world and proclaim to people who do not know Jesus the Lord's death until he comes. So the fourth facet, the fourth dimension, the fourth element of Lord's Supper is this outward dimension, recognizing we're called to show Christ, to follow Christ to the cross by how we live and how we take communion together. The fifth facet, if you're taking notes, comes from that same verse, looking forward. The fourth, fifth dimension, the fifth facet is looking forward until he comes again. Look at the end of verse 26. Paul writes, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he comes. This is this forward dimension to communion. You look forward to this day Jesus returns, when Jesus, he comes back and he unleashes the kingdom of God, when he makes all things new and he judges and restores the world to as it should be. You look forward to that day with hope. In Isaiah 25, and and you can write that down to look at it later, Isaiah 25, Isaiah, he writes about this future time. When Messiah comes and the new world is born, and he says, yeah, that day will be a feast. Choice meats, fine wines, food, drink, and Messiah will wipe away the tears off of every man, off of every woman's face. No matter the pain, the brokenness, or the grief you're currently facing, there will come a day when all of it will be nothing more than a distant memory. 
And on that day, God will, through Jesus, wipe your tears away and you'll be welcomed into the grand feast. Now, this imagery isn't unique to Isaiah. There's numerous passages scattered throughout the scriptures that echo and build upon Isaiah's vision here. In fact, at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 19, John uses this imagery of the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus as the bridegroom. Where we, God's people, we're the bride. And there's a coming day when all believers are going to gather back together again. And we have this all sorts of imagery here of a feast, a banquet, a wedding supper, a wedding banquet, this wedding party. And there's all these sorts of images of what the future will be like. And the Lord's Supper, it's like this signpost, like a, like a glimpse of what this day, one day in the future is going to look like. And when we take the bread and the cup, we look forward to that day when we will eat and drink with Jesus in the world made new. And we celebrate the fact that the new world, it's like right around the corner. It's like we can almost see it. And when we take communion, we look forward to what God is about to do in Jesus. So the fifth element of communion, it's looking forward. And when you take communion, you look forward to what God is about to do in Christ when he fully unleashes the kingdom of God. Now, the sixth and the final facet of communion, at least in these verses, is this inward dimension, this dimension that Paul really digs into, and it's where we look inward. All right, look at verse 27 here. Verse 27, he says, Or he writes again, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So when we take communion, we examine ourselves, we look inward. You probe yourself, you introspect, you take back all the layers, all the distractions, the to-do list, the things that you're thinking about what you need to do later today or this week or next month or the different uh, meetings you have, the you know, community group happening coming up soon or, or whatever those things. You take all of those distractions away. You get all of that out of your mind and you focus and you listen to the Spirit of God and you ask the Spirit to expose sins in your life to expose those areas in your life where you're not in line with the bread and the cup, where you're not in line with the gospel, where you're not in line with what Jesus is all about. Now, what does he mean by an unworthy manner? I think I need to take a second and clarify that because I hear a lot of bad interpretations out here. Not like in here, but just generally. Paul does not mean you have to be worthy to take communion. You don't have to get your act together and make sure you're all neat and tidy in order to take the bread and the cup. I mean, the point of of communion is that you are not worthy. The point of communion is that Jesus takes your place. His body breaks for you. His blood pours out in your place. He takes your sin, your shame, your guilt, all of that, your judgment. He takes all of that because you are not worthy. But he chases after you and loves you. The gospel is not get your act together, clean yourself up, and then when you're really nice and good and your hair is neat and tidy, then come to church and take communion and experience God's love. No, the gospel is the other way around. The gospel is when you're a wreck, when you're in addiction, when you are in chains, you're coming out of a, of a divorce, or you're in the aftermath and the carnage of your sin, your mistakes, your flaws, when you're empty, when you're chasing after idol, after idol, in an empty, vain pursuit, God chases after you in Jesus. God hunts you down in the best sense of the word. Paul writes to the Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't wait for you to come. He chases after you first. And when he gets within an earshot, he says, come and follow me. And the moment you turn around and you put out your hand, he grabs you and he pulls you out and he starts you down this long path to healing with all of your brokenness, all of your baggage, all of your dysfunction that every single one of us has. 
And he rescues and he saves broken people. That's the gospel. See, Paul is saying that in an unworthy manner, it's when you treat communion flippantly, like lazily, like, yeah, that's great, the gospel. Okay, cool. Let me move on. I already know that. What's next? No, you give worth to it. Think about what happened to Jesus. Jesus goes through God's wrath so that you can experience God's love. Jesus goes through death so you can experience life forever in the new creation. Take that seriously. Give worth and weight to that. But Paul's not done yet. He says in verse 30, This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So is God making the Corinthians sick because they're not taking communion seriously? I mean, that's definitely possible, right? I mean, look at what happened to Ananias Ananias and Sapphira. Like, that is a very real recognition that this could be happening to the Corinthians as well. Be sure to recognize that the early part of the church, God is protecting his bride. But the real question is, does that happen today? And I think the most honest answer I can tell after spending a ton of time studying this through the years, taking theology classes in seminary and Bible classes in seminary and more, is humbly, I can tell you, I don't know. God doesn't tell us, at least not in the sense of being able to identify when he's disciplining us and when he's not. But I will say this, there's this inexorable connection between our physical body and our spiritual soul. Now, as good modernists, we we like to categorize everything. We want to separate everything in life into these distinct boxes. But life just isn't that way. Like everything affects everything else. So is God punishing people or are are people getting sick? Does cirrhosis of the liver from drinking too much, does that come from drinking too much alcohol? Or is God causing your cirrhosis because you drink too much? Do you have heart attacks from idolizing work? Or do you get heart problems because of a poor work-life balance and the extra stress you put on yourself? Here's the thing. It's not either or. It's not one or the other. It's a both and here. God has designed our body in such a way that the best way, the most fulfilled way to live is to follow him. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't use pain. God uses pain. He uses illness, even trauma, to transform us, to be more like him. That doesn't also mean it doesn't mean it's always discipline, though. God refines us by the experiences that we have in ways that are not just disciplining us. He's a whole lot bigger than just discipline. He uses all kinds of things to refine us, to become more like him, to become more like his son, to follow his son. So no one can say that if you examined yourself perfectly before communion every time and you took communion every day, that you'd always be healthy. You also can't say that if you're, you're sick because you didn't look inward enough. Like, we don't have that knowledge. So look, look inward, but not out of fear. It's not about being worthy, but about recognizing the worth of what Jesus has done for us. It's about probing our hearts, exposing areas of sin, and aligning ourselves with the gospel but not out of fear that we might get sick if we don't, but out of the desire to be like Jesus, out of living a forgiven life. And so my prayer today is that you could dwell a bit more on the different facets of communion, looking around, looking back, looking upward, looking outward, looking forward, looking inward. I want you to remember these profound, the essence of communion that it's this communal act deeply rooted in the historical context and these traditions of Passover, and it fosters this intimate relationship between us and God. We come together to remember the God who he steps in and he chases after broken people, that it's the center, and we need to return to the Lord's Supper as the center, and we 
eat the bread and we drink the wine. And as we do that, take a moment for introspection to align ourselves, to align yourselves with the gospel. And communion is this rich, multifaceted experience that extends way beyond us as individuals. So many different facets. Dwell on that today. It encompasses our church community and it encompasses the world. Let's carry this understanding with us, not just today, but every time we gather for communion, every time you gather for communion together, think on these aspects. Pick one and focus on it or think of all of them. So we come together in Paul's language to eat. We come together to remember Jesus. We come together to remember the gospel. And as we come to the table in a minute, I want you to sit in this question. Like, I want you to examine yourself, like Paul says, and I want you to ask yourself, where is the gospel in my life? Is the gospel kind of off to the side? Or is it in the center? I mean, is the gospel, the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which the bread and the cup speak to, use Paul's language, proclaims. Is that kind of in the periphery? Like, yeah, I believe in the death, I believe in the burial, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but it's kind of like, it's over here. I have my life, I have my job, my career, I have my hobbies, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my wife, my husband, I have my family, I have my band, I have my whatever it is. And yeah, I believe in that, but it's kind of over here somewhere. Or is the gospel the front and center, the driving force of your life? Like you have your career, you have your job, your life for this or that, your friends, your family, your whatever. You have all of that, and all of that is important, but what really drives you, your center of gravity, and this is the story of Jesus in the gospel. Where is the gospel in your life? Here? Or yeah, it's like, okay, it's over there. Where is the gospel? Look inward and examine yourself. Will you pray with me? Father God, as we begin to prepare our hearts to approach the table today, as we've, as we've done that, may we look back and remember what the sacrifice that you made, that your son made for us on the cross. Remind us that we, we stand in your grace, not by our own merit, but through Jesus. We are right with you, not because of anything that we've done, but because of Jesus. May we look forward to the day when we will eat and drink with Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth. Help us to see beyond these present challenges that we face, knowing that one day you will make all things new and you will wipe all tears away. May we look inward, examining our hearts, probing our motives, listening to your Holy Spirit. If there's anything within us that is not pleasing to you, would you reveal that to us right now so that we can repent, so that we can change? May we look around to see if there's anyone we've wronged or who has wronged us. Give us the courage, the boldness to seek reconciliation, to confess our mistakes, to offer and to receive forgiveness. And may we look outward. Show us where you're calling us to serve, to love, and to proclaim the gospel with our words and our actions. Put specific names and faces in our hearts and in our minds. May we look upwards to you, Father. And may we experience a real encounter with you knowing that you are waiting for us here at the table as we come. It's in Jesus' name and by the Spirit, amen.